Today we begin what I'm calling a mini-sermon series on the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. Most of this chapter focuses on a very important topic, and that topic is temptation. We will be studying this morning and for the next two Sundays the temptations of Jesus. And as importantly as thinking about the temptations Jesus faced and how he faced them, we will also be reflecting upon our own temptations. So this morning we are listening to this text and we are thinking about what it is in our lives that tempts each one of us. I invite you to hear God's word this morning as it comes in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man, or human beings, shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. May God bless the reading and the hearing of this word this morning. I am told that before the coronavirus began spreading around, There were two men that worked together. There was an elderly man and a younger man that worked very closely together in an office setting. The older man always had a jar of peanuts on his desk, and the younger man loved peanuts. So one day, while the older man was away from his desk, the younger man yielded to temptation. He grabbed the jar of peanuts and ate almost half the jar. When the older man returned... The young man felt that his conscience was bugging him. He began to feel guilty, and he confessed to the older man what he had done. The elderly gentleman replied, Well, don't worry about it, son. I never eat those peanuts anyway. Since I lost my teeth, I just gummed the chocolate off the M&Ms and put the peanuts back (laughs) into the jar. We need to laugh every once in a while. I know it's silly, but listen, it's about temptation, and we need to laugh sometimes. Temptation sometimes gets us into trouble, doesn't it? Here at the beginning of a new year, some of us have been practicing resolutions. Maybe you set some goals. You want to improve some areas of your life or... Maybe it's not resolutions or goals, but maybe you just kind of reprioritize things in your life. You want to restructure how you live. You want to do some things differently. And you're trying during these first few days of 2021 to give some thought to your priorities and to make some changes. Well, of all the things that sidetrack us from making those changes and wanting to improve in our lives, one of those things that sidetracks us is temptation. It is, as we said last week, when Paul writes in Romans chapter 7, we relate to that so much when he says, listen, I don't understand what I do for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. That's what we often find ourselves doing when we're trying to prioritize our life and restructure things and have some different ways of living we don't find ourselves doing the things that we want to do. Paul continues, For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, he says, but the evil I want to do, this I keep on doing. We live in that tension. We we know what that is like. Why is this? Why does temptation often have such a hold over us? Why is it that we want to live life in a different way? We want to restructure and reprioritize and do things differently, but we keep finding ourselves falling 
to temptation. A little later, we're going to come back to our text for this morning because I believe Jesus has much to teach us about our struggles with temptation. And this Sunday and the next two weeks, we're going to talk about how Jesus handled these temptations. But this morning, let's start by clarifying what we're talking about. Let's be very specific. What actually is a temptation? Well, the dictionary defines temptation in this way. It says, temptation is, quote, the desire to do something, especially something wrong or unwise. Now, that definition is rather broad, and we understand that. It's true for everyone. Let's be a little more specific. Let's think about the Christian life, the life of faith. What is temptation for the Christian well, one person has said it this way, temptation in a biblical sense for the Christian is a situation in which one experiences a challenge to choose fidelity or infidelity to one's obligation toward God. I like that definition. Basically, he's saying for the Christian, temptation is when we face a decision to be faithful to God or not. And for whatever reason, temptation then is this strong and compelling desire to choose to be unfaithful. We all deal with temptation, every one of us. Thomas Akempis says it this way, Do not try to find a place free from temptations and troubles. Rather, seek a, a peace that endures even when you are beset by various temptations and tried by much adversity. William Penn says it this way. He says, "'Tis no sin to be tempted, but to overcome. But to be overcome, that is the sin." So what are the temptations that we face? Individually, we, don't str we struggle in our own ways, but it's interesting. I read the last couple of weeks about the Barna research team. They have been studying temptation for a number of years now, and recently they compiled a paper describing the changing nature of temptation in the world today. They explored what they called old temptations and then talked about some new temptations. I think what they found is very applicable to our lives. Listen as we talk about some of what they discovered. Here is a list of some old temptations. And by this, what we mean is temptations that have been around for a while. New temptations are those that are just recently developing. Here are some old temptations. Eating too much. Spending too much money. Gossiping. Feeling jealous or envy. Viewing pornography. Lying or cheating. Abusing alcohol or drugs. Doing something intimately inappropriate with another person. Now that's not an exhaustive list, but those are some of the primary, primarily the older temptations, the temptations that have been around for quite some time. And they're probably not surprising to us when I said temptation at the beginning of this sermon. Some of these actions or behaviors may have been what initially came into your mind. But the Barna research team also discovered what they refer to as new temptations. There are primarily two of them. Number one, spending too much time on media, particularly social media. Number two, going off on someone via text, email, or social media. In other words, it's easy to blast someone with our words when it's not face to face. They go on to say what their research is discovering, and here I find this quote interesting, quote, resolutions related to technology are becoming more and more common in our world today, particularly those involving spending less time with technology. The research shows that nearly half of Americans 
nearly half of Americans say they are tempted to spend too much time on media, including the internet, television, and video games. Is that an issue for you? Old temptations still occupy our lives as well. Listen to these statistics. About one-third of Americans, 35%, admit to spending too much money. One-quarter of Americans, 25%, say they are tempted to gossip or to say mean things about another person. A similar number, 24%, struggle with envy or jealousy. And a little more than 1 in 10, or 11 12%, are tempted to lie or cheat or admit to abusing alcohol and drugs. Well, there are also those temptations that are described as particularly Western temptations. These may not surprise you, but the numbers are rather alarming. Three out of five Americans, 60% of us say that we are tempted to worry or to be anxious. And about the same number of people say they struggle with procrastination or putting things off. These are serious temptations for almost two-thirds of people in our world. Well, these are some of our main temptations. But here's a couple of other things that are very interesting. One is this. The research shows most people do not know why they give in to temptation. When asked, why do you fail? Why can you not resist temptation? Most people cannot give a reason for why they fall to temptation. Over 50% of Americans say they can't give a reason for why they fail. Of those who can give a reason, here's what they would say. It's just an escape. It's just a way to leave the real world for a little while. I just want to feel less pain. I just don't want to feel as lonely. I want to satisfy the expectations other people have of me. Or it's just personal pleasure. But here's the most disturbing thing I read. The most disturbing piece of information in this study is that Barna's research team found that people have become disillusioned with trying to resist temptation. In other words, most people will admit they have struggled with temptation so much that they have simply given up trying to resist it. Most people say they feel completely powerless with the things that tempt them. So many people, many Christians, have simply stopped trying to resist the things that tempt them. In other words, temptation constantly wins. And we are caught in a trap of sin, guilt, and remorse in our spiritual lives. So what can we do? How do we handle times of temptation in our lives? Well, we come back to our text for this morning, and our text reminds us that the very first thing, the very first thing that happened to Jesus after his baptism was that he faced three huge temptations. The Bible says immediately following his baptism... Verse 1, chapter 4. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. Think about that. He had just been baptized. He comes up out of the water. Then immediately he is led or driven to the wilderness for a very specific purpose. Why? To be tempted by the devil. You see, that's why this passage is so important. What we're talking about this morning and the next two Sundays is so important for our lives 
for at least two reasons. Number one, Jesus dealt specifically with temptation, which means he knows exactly what we go through in our lives when we struggle with temptation. He knows the difficulties of being human and of struggling with those things that tempt us on a daily basis. He understands that. He's been there. Number two, how Jesus responds to these temptations establishes the standard for all of us. In other words, we learn how to deal with temptation when we look to what Jesus did and we apply his principles and his methodologies to our own lives. So this morning and for the next two weeks, we learn from Jesus. This passage today has so much to teach us, so much we could say, but I want to focus our remaining time on two very important matters. Number one, the scene, the wilderness, and number two, the bread, the actual temptation itself. Let's start with the scene, the wilderness. As I said just a moment ago, after his baptism, Jesus went into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. Think about this. The very same Spirit of God that descended on Jesus like a dove at his baptism. When he comes up out of the water, the Spirit of God descends upon him. That very same Spirit drives Jesus, leads Jesus into the wilderness. It is the Spirit of God who drives him there. Now, the wilderness, it's a difficult place to be. In the wilderness, literally and figuratively, people often lose their way. The wilderness is a place of despair, a place of confusion, a place of loneliness, a place of desperation. It's a place where a person can easily be hurt, even killed, The wilderness is a dangerous, risky place. One misstep in the wilderness can cause pain and heartache. It can change your life forever. But the Spirit of God drove Jesus into the wilderness, into this dangerous place. Why? Jesus was identifying with us. One person has written... The Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness because Jesus was so naturally attuned to God that he would not have experienced the full force of temptation, as you and I do, had he not gone alone and vulnerable to that place in the wilderness. Temptation was the strongest because the wilderness also represents the experience of being abandoned by God. The experience of being in a place where God is not. Jesus went from the profound experience of being baptized and coming out of the water and being literally showered by the presence of God, a mountaintop spiritual experience, he goes straight from that place to the wilderness, the depths of the valley. That's probably happened to all of us. You feel extraordinarily close to God, but then suddenly life turns upside down and you find yourself alone, confused, and frightened. Sometimes it happens at this time of the year, the holidays, wonderful, festive, joyful times. January, a cold, bitter wilderness. We hope and pray the virus continues to get better, and yet our reality is numbers continue to rise. We go from these mountaintops to these depths of the valleys. It happened to Jesus He understands. He felt the same way very early in his ministry. Jesus needed the experience of the sense of God's abandonment that often comes swiftly on the heels of God's strong and powerful presence in our lives. In fact, that's probably why Jesus prayed in the Lord's Prayer. And Lord, lead us not into temptation. In other words, we know... From what we read earlier, God doesn't tempt us, but don't lead us to the place where we are in the wilderness, 
feeling abandoned, where temptation is the strongest in our lives, don't lead us to the place where we don't feel close to you or experience your presence and your love. Jesus knew all about this. He knew all about the temptations we face because he experienced this wilderness in his life. He experienced the place where temptation is the strongest. He knew what it feels like for God's presence to be so far away. But in that scene, the specific temptation comes to him in the form of bread. Now, this was the first of three temptations that Jesus faced. It's important to remember, at this point in our text for today, Jesus had been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. Listen again to verse 2. And after he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. Think about that. No food, nothing to drink for 40 days, quite a long period of time. He was hungry, famished, according to many English versions of the Bible. That's why this temptation was so appealing, so enticing to him. What would be so wrong in this moment of physical need to turn a few stones into bread? We all need bread to eat. He hadn't eaten for 40 days. What would be so wrong with filling his physical body with nourishment that he needed? The answer Jesus gives is so important. It is written, he says, that we should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus was quoting scripture here. He knew It's very easy for us to fall into a trap. It is the trap of thinking that because we need food, then food is all we need. It is the trap of thinking that some things that are basic necessities in this physical world become the only things that really matter to us in all of life. You see, there's nothing wrong with eating or drinking Unless in doing so, we rob ourselves of something even better and more important, which is the nourishment of our souls and our spirits. The truth is, we do not live by food alone. We live, Jesus says, by our relationship with God. That is where true life is found. Now this morning, we know none of us live in a wilderness And to the best of my knowledge, there's not a person here who can turn stone into bread. But we do live in the most materialistic society the world has ever known. One person has written, The God of mammon is always around us as a false god, telling us every day that it can satisfy all of our real needs. Every day, every marketing message you and I receive tells us this line. Every day in our world, we are told that whatever the product, whatever the service, whatever the experience that is being offered to us, it will change your life. It will fill your need. It will accomplish what you need the most. Every day our world tells us that if we just get this, if we just accumulate, if we just fill our lives, then we will have the life that we want. But Jesus said it's just not true. It's just not true. It is as false as the line as Satan gives to Jesus in the wilderness. The things of this world, no matter what they are, can never satisfy the deepest needs of our lives. No matter what tempts us, no matter how enticing or appealing, this thing that tempts you cannot satisfy Your deepest need. That's what Jesus was saying to us. It is as the bumper sticker I read many years ago says, the best things in life are not things. If we learn to be satisfied with whatever is enough for that day, if we learn to accept that what God has graciously given to us 
in this moment, in this day, the manna God has given to us, if we learn to understand that that is enough, we will take away from Jesus something very valuable that will help us to resist all the false gods that become our temptations. When we are tempted, we can remember that whatever these things are, they will not satisfy us. They may dull our need momentarily, but we will be left empty. We will be left wanting Though we live by bread, we do not live by bread alone. We live by the breath of God. And anything else is fluff. Todd Hunter has written a book called Our Favorite Sins. In that book, he talks about temptation, but just want to share a few of his words with you. He says, the way we think about temptation matters a great deal. A generation ago, he writes, C.S. Lewis wrote the screw tape letters using creative conversation between a master devil and his apprentice and cutting to the very heart of how temptation works. His book became a Christian classic. And in one conversation, screw tape reminds his trainee, quote, nonsense in the intellect reinforces corruption in the will. Nonsense in the intellect reinforces corruption in the will. In other words, there is no important aspect of human life in which good thinking should not be preferred or valued over poor or wrong or misguided thinking. The darker our thoughts, the less clarity we have about anything in life. It is like driving at sunset and forgetting to remove sunglasses. At some point, you realize you're not seeing very well. So you remove the sunglasses and you enter a world of improved light and better vision. The same process works in our life of faith. The same thing is true with our temptations and with our sins. How do we recover our sight? How do we acquire more light? How can we resist and handle our temptations? Jesus says, I am the light of the world. In other words, I am what you need. So this morning, just 10 days into a new, world, a new year, what tempts you? What pulls you away from God? I ask you this morning, what keeps you from living the life you want and that God wants for you? Jesus said, I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. Whatever is tempting you will not satisfy you the way that I will satisfy you. For remember from our scripture reading earlier, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like the shifting shadows. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, this world is sometimes a dark and challenging place. This world often feels barren, empty, and overwhelming. In this world, Lord, temptation is so enticing. To find a few moments that will relieve our anxiety to experience just a couple of minutes away from the stress and worries of this world. Lord, like Jesus in the wilderness, there is so much to tempt us in this world. But help us to remember, we do not live by the things of this world alone, but most importantly, we live through you. 
So in these dark and difficult days, Lord, lead us and guide us and grant us the light of your love and your mercy. For we pray in the precious and holy name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.